Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Google Hangout here at the Wildlife Conservation Society. My name is Megan Malaska, and we're so excited for you to join us again for another Google Hangout um, here at the Bronx Zoo today. Um, so today, first off, I would like to welcome the three classes that we have joining us. Classes, if you can wait, have um, Miss Fourth Grade Wright City West Elementary class from Wright, Missouri. We also have Mr. Michaela's fifth and sixth grade class from Lakin Middle School in Lakin, Kansas. And also Ms. Hall's kindergarten class in Crosby, uh, Crosby Kindergarten Center in Crosby, Texas. So good morning, classes. I hope you're all doing well this morning and having a good morning. Um, welcome to our viewers at home. Uh, and today we're going to focus on our tufted penguins here at the Aquatic Birdhouse at the Bronx Zoo. Um, there's lots of noises going on already in here. And um, we have our senior keeper, Tim Mole, with us this morning. So Tim has actually been working with the WCS and, um, I'm sorry, Wildlife Conservation Society, for those that don't know what WCS is, um, and has actually gone through many of our education programs from our teen internship. He's also worked at the Children's Zoo here um, and has worked his way up with a degree now and is working as a senior keeper at the World of Birds exhibit here at the Bronx Zoo. And if you didn't know, the Bronx Zoo is part of the Wildlife Conservation Society. Uh, we have five facilities here in the New York City area. We have the Bronx Zoo, Central Park Zoo, Prospect Park Zoo, New York Aquarium, and Queen Zoo. But the organization is global, so we are doing projects all around the globe. Uh, we have about 500 conservation projects going on in about 60 countries. So not only are we in New York City, but we're all over the place. Uh, and today we're going to focus on our tufted penguins. So, um, oh, and if you want to add, uh, send any questions in, you can send questions into our Q&A app through Google Hangout. Um, you can also tweet us which is very appropriate for our hangout for today. I don't think Puffins tweet, though, do they? But <laughs> you can tweet us at WCS Puffins HOA. And without further ado, um, I have some questions for Tim. So the first question is, I'm going to get to my next card. <laughs> what can you tell us about these birds and the exhibit that they live in? This is a very cool exhibit, and these are very cool birds. Uh, these are the tufted puffins. They are found along the Pacific coast of the United States of America, from Alaska all the way down to about, cent about central California. And the cool thing about this exhibit is, and what started around the mid-60s with William Conway, he tried to make exhibits look more naturalistic so that animals, so for the public can see them and see them in their more natural setting, but as well as making the animals seem more comfortable being in their natural settings. So, as I said, this is a one of the first exhibits of its kind, a polar exhibit, a underwater viewing area, and we have a bunch of sea cliffs behind us, and all those little cubby holes and nooks and crannies within crevice are actually breeding holes for the puffins to use for their nesting, or, um, or if they're ever threatened and they need to get away, they can go into those holes. Um, and, so, and this is also a temperature uh, temperature controlled exhibit as well to make them seem more in their natural settings. And, um, so yeah, so that was built in about 1964. This building was restructured from the floor up, and this is one of the um, groundbreaking cooler exhibits that I've had a chance to work with. Wonderful. So we have a little tufted penguin who's following us around right now too. I think he's trying to steal your thunder. Um, <laughs> where do the puffins get their names from? 
the puffins, as you can see, are slight puffy. Um, they are usually they're the attribute of their body size. Um, the adults, as well as the offspring, are very rounded in shape, little small football size, um, football shaped animals. So that um, that is where they thought that where they got their name from. Their chicks, especially when they're in the burrows, are very. Um, very downy cover. Downies are those small, tiny, fluffy feathers that often make up your uh, your pillowcases, and those are very good for insulating. So where these animals are from uh, in the northern hemisphere, it's very, very cold. So they need to be protected from those colder temperatures. So if you were to look at a puffin chick, it's very fluffy or very puffy. So um, often, tufted puffins also puff up along with other puffins. They puff up to make themselves look bigger in an aggressive behavior if they're ever threatened by a, another animal or another puffin. Excellent. So now that we have a little baseline information about our puffins, let's see if our classes have any questions. So let's first go to Ms. Hall's Crosby Kindergarten uh, class. Do any of you have a question for Tim? Do you guys have a question for us for kindergarten class? If not, I think we have our question. We are more than happy to ask for you. <laughs> okay, so um, we are having a little technical difficulties with them, but we are going to ask their questions for, for them. So the first question is, how do puffins carry so many fish in their beaks? So puffins have a very cool adaptation. Their beaks um, slightly serrated, but they also use their tongue. So as they catch one fish, they'll actually use their tongue to hold down another fish so that they can open up the top part of their bill to catch other fish at the same time. Uh, puffins will go out to sea and come back with tens, if not dozens, of fish at a time in order to feed their chicks. Uh, this is actually one of our offspring that we had hatch here last year. So he is very, very gregarious. Um, a lot of fun to work with this guy who follows us around. So one of his, one of his parents would actually go down to our feeding pans or stations, and then multiple fish at a time would carry, use that adaptation and carry those fish up to the nest site. So. Um, I think the record is 62 fish at a time. I'm assuming those are probably smaller fish, but um, but yes. Yeah, so that that is a very cool adaptation about how they carry their fish in their mouth. So to follow up on that is how do you provide food for them here at the zoo? Um, pretty simple. We have fisheries that we get pallets of frozen fish in, and then we will thaw it out on a daily basis as far as we need. Uh, we're very conscious of our fisheries and trying not to over um, draw from our <coughs> fish population in the world. So we will use specific locations that we get our fish from. But uh, once we thaw that fish out, we have silver sides, we have spear, uh, we have capelin, we have herring, a, v a variety of fish to make sure that these guys are getting the variety that they might find in the wild. And then we have secretly placed behind the rock. Work, we have metal pan holders that hold the pan, so the exhibit still looks like a natural setting, but we also have the ability to change out food pans and clean them just like you would clean your dishes at home after you have dinner. So. You clean your dishes after? Okay, good. <laughs> um, and then the last question from the kindergarten class is, when they're searching for food, how do they open their eyes underwater? Very cool adaptation for a lot of sea animals or water-dwelling animals. Um, they have what we call a nictitating membrane. So it's really cool see-through membrane on an animal's eye. So they don't close their eyelids when they're underwater. The nictitating membrane, when they know they're going to go underwater, will actually cover them. So it's sort of like a natural goggles that, that animals have evolved over millions and millions of years. So. A lot of, like I said, a lot of seabirds sea have them, uh, crocodiles, alligators, lots of varieties of animals have what we call nictitating membranes. Excellent. So we're going to try asking another class for their question. So if we can, if we can get um, Lakin's um, elementary, I'm sorry, the middle school. 
What are the tufts for? Um, why do they have those long eyebrows? Eyebrows. These are called tufted puffins because they have these cool tufts that are coming off. They look like funny eyebrows. Um, there is no specific reason why they have them as far as adaptation for survival. A lot of seabirds um, differentiate from other species of seabirds by their um, sexual mature adaptations. So during the breeding season, both males and females will grow these tufts in and it will often show another individual that um, and usually the length or the quality of the way that the tufts look can show another individual how healthy that animal is and if they're willing to mate up with them. Um, as you see, our, our little offspring from last year hasn't developed his little tufts yet, and they also will develop this cool mask that's on top of their bill. Uh, some of our individuals have started to grow this in for their breeding season, and both the tufts will molt off at the end of the breeding season as well as that little mask will pop off as well. So um, there's no specific reason, but it's an individual uh, spe individual characteristic for this species. Great question. Can we have another question from the class, please? Do the males and females look different? Why do males and females look different? Is that the question? Excellent. So, uh, these guys, act, there's a very, very slight size difference between males and females. Um, usually the way we tell them apart is whether one lays an egg or if they have, uh, if two of them pair up and they have viable offspring, which is fantastic. Um, sometimes we can actually all send off feathers to a company and they can do a DNA sample and tell us if it's a boy or girl that way, which is a super cool way. Um, but literally, unless the male and female are sitting side by side, it's very difficult to tell a male and female apart from each other. So that's called uh, lack of sexual dimorphism. Excellent. And do we have another class question from Lake and Middle School? Are they soft? Are they soft? Are they soft? Uh, when they are on land and they've dried off, um, they are soft. I wouldn't say they're super puffy. Uh, they're not a cuddly animal because most seabirds have a very, um, I don't want to say aggressive behavior, but they need to be, these are not our pets. These are wild animals. So we try to keep our hands off and we try not to treat them like pets. So they, if they feel threatened and they have a very strong bill, they will be very aggressive. So that sort of takes away from their soft characteristics. But as far as their bodies, their feathers, yes, they are pretty soft. Excellent. Great question. Do... OK, so um, next question I have is, um, in terms of what you've observed, what are typical behaviors of puffins, and what do they mean? Puffins have a lot of physical characteristics that they demonstrate. Um, just as a, a human being walking from one place to another, how you carry yourself can explain a lot to another individual of your, your, um, your intentions. So if a puffin was to walk slowly through with his head down, it would be a non-threatening posture. Uh, often, if they stand there with their chest puffed up or they flap their wings, that right. it could be a threatening, threatening posture, or they can possibly be protecting their nest. Uh, during breeding season, what they often do is they often rub bills yes. and uh, try to find an appropriate mate, and that often gets the colony that's around them very excited because um, they sort of breed off of each other and they sort of start the, the breeding season. So if they see one group starting up, they get very excited themselves, so they will get excited about that. Um, but as I said before, these guys can be pretty aggressive towards each other. So another behavior would be possible bill sparring. Um, would be bill sparring. They would grab each other's bills. They would flap each other's wings or hurt each other. Uh, one of my favorite characteristics of these guys is their vocalization. When they are threatened and they're by their burrows, they often honk. And it's like a honk. But when they're inside their burrows, it resonates really cool. So that is by far one of my favorite noises that you could hear at the zoo if you ever get a chance to work with tufted puffins. Um, some of the other adaptations, they, uh, they swim underwater really, really well. The seabirds, they use their wings. They can fly above water, but they also use their wings to fly underwater as well. And, um, and they use their feet as rudders as they swim underwater. 
<laughs> Excellent. And we actually have some uh, questions from the field. Um, so we have um, from Fran Martinez. Um, Fran Martinez is a math teacher in Spain and would like to know, are there um, differences between your zoo and Spanish zoos? And are any animals in the Bronx Zoo that they can't hear in Spain? So a little different from, and we might even have stumped him. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what animals are held in Spain. Um, these are, are the Pacific Coast puffins. Um, I would assume that the Spain zoos might have Atlantic or horned puffins. So the difference would be of the four species. These guys look more like parrots with a just orange bill and they got the white eyes and the cool tufts but they look more like parrots. If you were to look at your Atlantic or your horned puffins, they mo look more like clowns. They've got more coloration in their bill. Their eyes are really bright, uh, the, and the white on their eyes are really, really bright. So, um, very cool, but I would assume that the, the ones in Spain, they, they would go with their local, their local colonies that they have there. Great, and we have one more question from the field, too, from uh, Sherry Meckin. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name. But are puffins and penguins related? Puffins and penguins are not related. Uh, these are more the northern hemisphere counterpart to penguins. Penguins cannot fly, puffins can. That, that is a big difference in adaptation. But they sort of fill, these fill the northern hemisphere niche that penguins fill in the southern hemisphere. So there's a, there's a big difference about their morphology and their, their body structure than penguins. Again, these guys can fly and they can, even though they look like little softballs and sometimes they fly like a curveball, uh, they can fly pretty well. They can actually fly up to 45 to 50 miles an hour in the air and um, sometimes you'll get our guys, they'll fly across the exhibit and they'll do little cannonballs in the pool and they'll splash the, our nice clean windows, but um, they can fly but penguins cannot, so they are not the same. Great. So now we're going to go to um, our third school, which is Wright City Elementary School. Great, guys. So do you guys have a question? I'm blocking the way of the puffin. I'm sorry. <laughs> About how many tough puff puffins would you find in a normal flock? I'm so sorry. Can you repeat that one more, please? Say it again. About how many tough puffins would you find in a normal flock? How many puffins would we find in a flock? So uh, puffins actually, they, they colonize together. So when they're breeding, that's when groups of large groups of puffins um, accumulate together. And they can be into groups of hundreds. Uh, I think the Puffin Project we're work the, um, that Audubon has been working on, and they reestablished a... A, a colony there, and I think they've got about 900 breeding pairs that return on a regular basis. Uh, but as a flock, when they fly out to sea, they are pretty solitary animals, and they hang out in pairs in their breeding pairs, and then they would come back and hang out with the colony in their breeding. Excellent. Uh, do you have another question for Tim? <laughs> What type of education do you need in order to work with animals like the puffins? Did you hear that one? Um, I love this question because I was very, very into animals and into being a vet. And I wanted to be a vet so bad, but when I went to school and I realized I wanted to work more day-to-day, -day, hands-on with the animals, so I went along the lines of animal education in college. A lot of friends of mine have been volunteers, and uh, they spent a lot of their spare time and extra time looking up and finding um, uh, something along the lines of the Wildlife Conservation Society where they can volunteer and help out. So that is a great way for students to start out their program. They get in the door, they find out what animals do they like to work with. Um, education, education in the field definitely helps out with taking care of these animals on a higher level. Um, just you don't necessarily need a college degree to work with them, but it um, certainly helps out and it makes for you know better care for the animals. But so, along those lines, is, is, is a good way to go as far as taking care of puppies. 
So we, we, I think we have some, some class walking through behind us, so it might get a little loud for a second. Um, but so what would your advice be for kids who, what, would, what, what can they do now in elementary school and middle school? Um, keeping interested in what you love, keeping a nerd. Um, keep visiting zoos, keep learning, keep supporting. Um, supporting the societies that help out these animals and, and like I said keep learning about the animals that you love and it'll help you prepare yourself so when you're ready to start working you're ready to start volunteering when you're ready to start volunteering you're, you, you've got a head start you, you, you know you know what you want to do and you know the direction you want to go and what animals you might want to take care of and do puffins, I mean, they seem to be um, doing just fine in here. Do they have um, any enemies in the wild, and are they endangered? Puffins are not endangered, but they are threatened by both global warming and overfishing. They, their natural predators in the wild include bald eagles. We have a greater black back gull. Um, so those those. Predators would eat the animal, uh, would, uh, would attack a puffin in the air or out on sea. They also have predators that humans have, have introduced to breeding colonies, such as rats and cats. Uh, so when these animals are breeding and they're very vulnerable because they're on land, um, so rats and cats will often attack the chicks or eat the eggs. But as uh, adaptation of these puffins is to if they can find a place to nest, which is a lot safer for them, they'll find a cliff face just like this, and that makes them less vulnerable to the predators that they might find in the wild. And their their cliffs don't look too comfy. Would you be comfortable resting on them like they do? These guys, these guys seem to do really, really well. As, as uncomfortable and uh, narrow the ledges that we have in here, it's they get around very, very gracefully. Um, they they hop up on these cliffs like they've been, you know they they know exactly what they're doing. Their their web feet have little claws on the edges of them, so they can they can walk in and they don't lose their footing on ice or anything else. So they've got very very cool adaptations that help them um, that help them hop around on these cliffs. Excellent. Um, and. Is there anything that families, um, kids at home can do besides coming to the aquatic birdhouse and seeing these tufted uh, puffins? Is there anything that they can do to love them even more if they just fell in love with these birds after seeing them today? Like I said, uh, keep learning, keep doing research. Uh, it's very important for, I mean, I'm politically, for politicians to know how important animals are to you so that fisheries and legislation we can work together so we can make um, safe areas available for these guys as well as regulations on fish <laughs> we can make regulations on fisheries so these animals have a food source to provide for their for themselves and their offspring so so caring for these animals and making sure other people understand how important these animals are is a very big role that you guys can play with these guys Excellent. Um, seeing if we have any other questions from the field. I'm going to stall for a little bit. Uh, we can admire the, the adorable puffins in the background. Um, even they get itches on their heads too, don't they? <laughs> and how good are they at, I mean obviously they are built for the water too, but how do they with their web feet, how do they balance not only in the water but they on land too. Sort of, sort of short and squat. So they have a very low center of balance, which helps them out. Um, they do pretty well hopping around on the cliff faces, and um, they also, just like other penguin adaptations and puffin adaptations and seabirds, they've got waterproofing. So uh, that's very important. As they grow in their adult feathers, they still have those downy feathers underneath them, and then they grow in their adult plumage on the outside, and all water-dwelling animals, water -dwelling animals um, they will actually coat their feathers with a very, um, very fine oily substance from a, a gland that they have on their back, and they'll actually go over every single feather and they'll coat that with oil. And it's not 
oil like a oil spill oil. It's uh, a friendly oil that they produce from their own body, and that's how the water cascades off their back. Or if you ever see a duck bathing, you see the water sort of pell it up and run off their backs. So that keeps these animals dry, and um, that keeps these animals dry and a lot warmer in their cold temperatures that they have to deal with in their habitats. Um, okay, and it looks like we have another question, which I'm going to go off camera to read it because my eyes aren't that good. Um, but from Michelle Rosero, um, from Mrs. Uh, Heitzman's fifth grade class in Fort Stewart, Georgia, do the puffins make the breeding pools in the ice? Oh no, their um, their breeding holes are actually on land. They go to shore type areas such as a cliff face or um, um, a rocky shore where they find their holes. They will dig holes in the soil, can go up to two to three feet deep. And puffins are actually a very clean animal. If they have, they'll have multiple areas of their burrow, uh, one for the care of the young and another one that's actually a bathroom, and so they can don't have to worry about living in feces while they're in that small little confined space. They'll actually poop out, you know, they're into that specific area. Or with our guys, what they'll actually do is they'll they'll back themselves out and they'll poop out of the nest itself into the exhibit rather than soiling their their little area. So it's a, a very cl a very clean animal. And the last question is are they cold blooded or warm blooded? They are warm-blooded. They regulate their own body temperature, which is very important that they have all these feathers, um, the, the, the downy feathers underneath, so they give the layers of air and feathers that keep them warm, and then they're covered with those adult feathers that I talked about. And um, they also have a lot of cold weather. Cold weather animals have cool vascular systems on their feet. Since they don't have feathers on their feet, you would think their feather, their feet might get cold, but they've got a lot of veins and arteries that go along the surface of their feet that keep the temperature of their feet a lot warmer, and so they don't have to worry about freezing in the cold temperatures. So again, they're warm-blooded, and then they have more adaptations that help them stay warm even though they live in cold temperatures. Well, you are very knowledgeable about these, these puffins, aren't you, Tim? Thank you so much for sharing all of your tremendous information. Thanks to the tough puffins for their wonderful sleeping abilities today uh, and, and their showmanship, yes. Thank you so much for our three classes. Thank you so much for your excellent questions. Um, we hope you had a great time. Thanks to our viewers at home. Um, you also sent in some great questions as well, so thank you for that. Um, this will be recorded and broadcast on our YouTube channel, and then we have another Google Hangout on Thursday, April 16th, which will be focused on our grizzlies at the Central Park Zoo. So um, you can don't forget you can come check out these tufted puffins here at the Aquatic Bird House um, at the Bronx Zoo, and we hope to see you back here soon. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.